Mahindra World City, Jaipur. Please welcome historian and award-winning journalist Dan Jones to introduce Mary Baird for this session. Well, good. Is it good morning or good afternoon? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure and a real privilege um, for me to welcome to the Jaipur Literature Festival the one and only Dame Mary Beard, who I, I, is modest, <laughs> modest even about her, her many uh, awards. I, I tried to write down just what you do, and it, it took several lines. A classicist, historian, polemicist, journalist, blogger, TV presenter, radio host, academic, Professor of Classics, Fellow of Newnham, you've just won an, another medal, I believe. Oh, shit, yes. Yeah, the another medal. Squad. The awkward squad. The J. Paul Getty Medal for Contribution <laughs> to the Arts. I mean, look, <laughs> Mary Beard is, is, is really the one and only. She's the author of many excellent books, including her recent essay on, on women and power, which you're going to be discussing later it's this afternoon. afternoon. Um, her books include 2008... Uh, book about Pompeii, but it's her phenomenally successful and much-loved recent survey of Rome and the Roman Empire, SPQR, that we'll be discussing today. Now, in Mary's own words, Rome matters. And I'm sure that in the next um, hour or so, she'll convince any of us who might have dreamed of wavering on that point that it really does. Now, Mary, I read SPQR um, on holiday uh, by the pool, where I'd normally read sort of trashy detective <laughs> novels. And, and I, I raced through it. I loved it. Um, it, it, it reads like a thriller. But tell us, for those of us who don't know, what does SPQR stand for? Right, Let's SPQR start with... is uh, the four letters that is now, certainly in modern Italy, uh, most familiar from the drains and manhole covers of the city of Rome, because it is still the logo of Rome as a city, and it stands for Senatus Populusque Romanus, and that means the Senate and people of Rome. And it, it's a, it sounds a bit, um, uh, it sounds a bit like something you read about in school, but I think that um, for me, why I chose it as as the title of the book, was that in those four letters, you get a view of Rome that is not just emperors and aristocrats. The point about Rome is it continued always to see itself as a society where the people, the populace, the P, really matters. You couldn't define Rome ever. Even when the most monstrous tyrant was on the throne, you couldn't define Rome without including the Roman people as an integral part of that. So for me, it stood for the idea of taking a broad look at Roman culture, not just a look at the toffs. Did your publishers complain when you suggested it as a title? Because I imagine the search engine optimization for <laughs> SPQR is terrible. Well, the truth is um, that it was chosen as a title. I have to say, I've kind of made it look as if it was entirely by me. Um, it was um, chosen as a working title by a wonderful guy who was the first editor of the book. Uh, uh, and when he signed it up for the publishers, he said, well, let's call it SPQR. And we went on calling it SPQR. Sadly, this wonderful guy died. And when it came to actually sending the book to press, I did sit there and I think, is SPQR really such a good idea? You know, are we, you know, who's going, how are you going to look this up? You know, are people going to say, you know, what on earth does that mean? And leave it on the other side. But by the time I'd finished the book, I was so tired that I, could, I thought, oh God, I can't. You know, I can't be doing with thinking with a title as well. We're just going to leave it as SPQR. Now, uh, one thing to say about it is it did actually in the end work. I think it, people were just curious enough 
um, to know that this was interesting even if they didn't know what it meant. But for me, the real, real advantage has been that when it gets translated into any language, the title is the same. So, so that, you know, instead of, you know, finding that you've been translated as, you know, you know my Pompeii book, you know, The Eye of the Storm or something, and you think, oh, God, that's my book on Pompeii. SPQR is the same in every in every language using the Latin alphabet there is. So I, I was very pleased in the end. Now, people have been writing histories of Rome, big histories of Rome, at least since Gibbon, which is now a quarter of a millennium ago. Firstly, why do you think the subject has proven so enduringly popular? And what was your aim in writing your version? Um, I think that's right. I just correct you slightly to say people have been writing big histories of Rome since the first century <laughs> AD, actually. So, you know, Gibbon was a bit of a you know, Johnny-come-lately, actually, um, in a long tradition. And I, I think there are good and bad reasons. And I, I mean, there, there is a, a, a horrible, I have to say, in some in some quarters, a horrible blokish satisfaction and combination of satisfaction and curiosity with this militaristic empire, right? Blokish. Blokish. Okay. You know? And I have to say that I've, I've never been that much interested in that. I've also never been that much interested in the question that really got Gibbon going, which was why did Rome fall? I mean, I can see the intellectual interest, but you'll notice if you read the book that I decide to stop well before Rome is falling because people have been working on that question for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, with not very much profit. I was much more interested in two things which made me want to write the book. One was not why did Rome fall, but why on earth did it get, why did it rise? I mean, Rome, if you go back to the 8th century BC, Rome is a very ordinary, rather dull, poxy little cattle town in a malarial swamp, basically. And it doesn't look as if it's going anywhere. Uh, 400 years later, for better or worse, it is controlling most of Italy and soon most of the Mediterranean. Now, my question really was, how the hell does that happen? You know, how can we possibly... I don't want to approve of it, but I do want to understand it. And I think that, was, that went side by side within a sense uh, of the question that you already asked me. I mean, I found myself both interested in the history of Rome and why it went the way it did, but always at the back of my mind has been... But why are we so interested in this? Why has it gripped people? What has it done to, you know, what kind of questions does it raise and what kind of answers does it offer? So there's a history there, but there's also a kind of lurking meta history of, you know, why do we think this is interesting still? You know, for God's sake, 2,000 years ago, um, why bother? And of course, in, in some ways, that's, the, the appeal of history in general, isn't it? I mean, there, there are these two things going on at once, which is the, the somewhat, uh, what can be very arcane interest in a subject matter for its own sake, but also, of course, history tends to work best when it speaks to something either enduring or particular to the time. I mean, w take us to the time when you were writing this book. What was the sort of the, the, the politics, the milieu? I mean, it, this is pr presumably pre-Trump, pre all the other stuff we, we can get onto. Uh, uh I was writing this pre-Trump, but I have to say, um, these days, w when I get emailed or phoned by journalists, uh, the most common question I now get asked is, what emperor is President Trump most like? Right? <laughs> uh, and uh, I find this extremely irritating. Um, because although I think there are all kinds of things I've got to say that make Roman history still interesting, the idea that there are, you know, nice little parallels that you can draw between, you know, the Emperor Nero and 
the president or between the quotes, I'm putting this in inverted commas, please, the collapse of the American empire uh, and the collapse of the Roman empire just seems to me to be a, a very naive way of using history. I, what I usually do is if these journalists ring up, uh, I either, if I've got time, make them hang on the phone while I give them a long lesson about why it's a stupid question. Um, or, if I haven't got so much time, I offer them the name of an emperor they've never heard of. <laughs> and I know they'll have to go and Google it, because they, they, they don't like to say, oh, I've never heard of him. You know, so. well, and they just want you to say Nero. I mean, they, they, they want a 10-second conversation. They want Caligula or Nero. Um, I usually give them, the emperor they don't usually have heard of is Elagabalus of the third century <laughs> AD. And I tell you, Elagabalus makes Nero look like a real sweetie pie. <laughs> well, you better tell us about Elagabalus. <laughs> Elagabalus is an extremely interesting confection of mad fantasy history writers of the fourth century AD looking back. And he actually collects, they... they they write his biography by collecting every sin that any emperor ever had and putting it together into one. And uh, I think you, you get the picture, I think, if you... There is a, a quite long uh, and almost entirely unreliable biography of him. But the, the key is that he is always uh, conflicting with the laws of nature. So uh, he never eats fish when he's by the sea. He only eats fish in land. And he only has ice in the summer. Um, and that's jolly difficult if you're a Roman to get ice in the summer. Um, and he, he kind of exposes the mad sort of whimsicalness of uh, the image of the Roman Empire. So he, he's particularly good at dinner. Uh, and he'll decide to have coded dinner parties. So he will either have all blue dinner parties or all red dinner parties or all uh, dinner parties where he only has invited the very fat. And, and he has a load of practical jokes. I mean, he sounds... I'm making him sound as nice, but I can tell you he's not. Um, yeah, so he invents the whoopee cushion. So he gets all the very fat to dinner and he puts them on blown up cushions. And then he has slaves go round behind. I don't believe any of this, but it is a good story. And pull out the plug so that these fat guys just gradually sink down. <laughs> you, I mean, it, you couldn't have made a better movie. About, and it's surprising that I think no movie has been made of the life of Elagabalus. Well, I, I think after today, maybe there should be. Um, OK, so if Rome doesn't just matter as an analogy for Trump's America, which I still find slightly hard to believe, but OK. Um, at the risk of asking a very, very broad question, why does Rome matter? Let's get into the heart of it. What is it about this that, that matters to us so much? Oh, I'm, I'm going to be um, slightly controversial as any people who love Greece in the room. And I think one of the most important things about Rome... Uh, as a society to study, look back to, and to puzzle about, is the fact that it was so big. Right? Uh, in the first century BC, AD, uh, Rome is a city of a million people. So actually what Rome is inventing in the West, because I think you could do the same with Beijing if you were to look at China, Rome in the West is actually discovering and inventing the, nat the very nature of politics on a wide scale. Uh, it's, this is mass politics. So if you go to uh, Athenian democracy of the 5th century BC, and there are, what, 30,000 Athenian citizens? Um, you know, that's the size of a kind of average university, you know, so no wonder they can have a democracy because there's not very many of them. So what Rome is, is really struggling with and trying to work out and writing about it, uh, you know, with enormous sophistication, actually, is what is the nature of the responsibilities and the privileges of being a citizen and being a free citizen in a world that big. And I think that in many ways, much of our 
global, now global vocabulary of human rights, of civic rights, are not so much inherited from the Romans, but have developed in dialogue um, with the way the Romans thought about what it was to have liberty in a vast conglomeration of people. Now, you made the comparison there between Rome and ancient Greece. And I can remember, a, I think it was a, a BBC commissioning editor at one point um, saying, uh, declaiming, as they wont to do, uh, that the difference between Greece and Rome is that the Greeks are like aliens and the Romans are like humans. And then, you know, we can relate to Rome, we can't to Greece. I mean, is that just a sort of a, a glib TV commissioning editor statement, or is there some germ of truth in that? There's an element of truth in it. Um, but it's partly because what the, the literature that survives from the Roman world is just so much vaster and more varied in extent than what survives from democratic 5th century Athens, that we get to see Rome from so many different perspectives. Now, uh, we don't get to see it from a female perspective. Um, we don't much get to see it from the perspective of Rome's victims, though the Greek world was conquered by Rome and they talked a lot about the nature of what it was like to be made to be part of the Roman Empire. But we get a range of material from um, high-level theorizing, high-level rhetoric um, to, oh, books of collections of Roman jokes, uh, ideas about how you might interpret your dreams, uh, cookery books. And so you get that much wider underbelly of a kind of sense of what it was to be Roman than you ever get uh, uh, of what it was, I think, to be a Greek. Certainly, I mean, when I say Greek, I mean Athenian. We know almost nothing about any other classical Greek city. So there's, there's an element, or a, a, a huge element, which is just the availability of evidence. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, ancient historians usually get up at gatherings like this, and what they say is, oh, it's terrible, we, have, we know so little about this, and we know so little about that, and they're terribly kind of curmudgeonly gloomy old bastards, I think, usually, and they say, oh, there's so much we want to know about the Romans that we don't, you know, economic history, etc. I think quite the reverse, actually. You know, if you go to the shelves and shelves of what survives from ancient Rome. There is more there than any person, certainly me, could read and think about in a lifetime. You know? and that's, that's quite incredible. So I, I think you write about this in the book, but what's the next time after the, the sort of the, the high period of Roman history that you, you can get to know uh, an age of people in this way? Well, you know, I'm thinking here largely about Europe, um, but in European history, it's not till the Florentine Renaissance, really, it's the 14th century. Um, I mean, what you have in Rome, and you know, what people I think are still not sort of just surprised enough by, is for certain periods of Roman history, you get private letters written day by day, uh, actually describing what is going on in the city. Now, that's a, a, a kind of richness of evidence. It doesn't always help uh, answer the questions you want to answer, but it's a kind of richness and kind of grittiness uh, of, of surviving material that is unbelievably um, rare for, for anything uh, in the West before the 15th century. Now, we, we talk a lot about the Romans as one sort of homogenous group. You've already mentioned that it's, it's, it's close to impossible to know very much uh, about the female experience of, of living in Rome. But we're also, when we talk about the Romans, uh, you know, at the greatest extent of, of Roman conquest, talking about a people that exist between Syria and Spain and as far north as northern Gaul and, and into Britain. Is it actually possible to talk about a Roman experience? Do we have to differentiate between the city yeah. of Rome and everywhere else? Yeah. I mean, how, how does yeah. it break down? I mean, I think the, the big question in Roman history, the simplest and the, and the least possible to answer, is what is a Roman? You know, is it a, you know, a, a, a woman's slave on Hadrian's wall 
um, versus uh, a rather posh senator in Rome? Do they have anything in common? Well, very little, except they live in a world which is connected and joined up. I mean, I think the, the, the thing that is amazing about the Roman Empire, and this is not a, in any sense a justification of the Roman Empire, which was a brutal, nasty military machine in all kinds of ways, but what is extraordinary is that it trades on connectivity. And so that if you are in, say, ancient Pompeii, just south of Rome, you, know, you have on your walls, if you have any money to spare, you can have on your walls at least imaginary pictures of what Egypt looks like. You, know, you, are, you are celebrating uh, and the, the Roman state, for better or worse, and I don't think its motives were entirely you know, liberal here, uh, that, that there's a celebration of a world which shares things. You know, the idea that in the first century AD, you could get on a road in Spain, stick on that road, and end up in Rome three weeks later is something that in Western Europe was entirely, entirely new. Now, the motives the Romans had for building those roads were very varied, you know, largely a mark of sheer power. Look, I can build a road through your territory, and I damn well will, right? Um, but it's, it's suggesting that, we, we, that you're living in a joined-up world. And I, I think that's, what, that's what's new. Uh, it's a joined-up world that is exploitative, that has vast disparities of wealth and power and status in, in a way that we would find I mean, not just appalling, but inconceivable, I think. Uh, but it's a world which can think of itself as linked. But a, a world in which uh, connectivity is advancing rapidly and there are enormous disparities in, in wealth and state. I mean, is that really so far from <laughs> w the world we're living in today? Well, I think it, it makes us think afresh about our world. I mean, as I was saying when I, about the Trump question, you know, I, I think the reason for studying Roman history is not to find nice little analogies to, oh, look, he looks a bit like, you know, Mr. Trump, or this looks like the fall of the uh, British Empire, Roman Empire, whatever. But I think that it, in some ways, Rome is a very interesting lens through which to think differently about uh, ourselves and our values, um, global, now global selves and, and values. And that's partly because they're different from us and partly because they seem at some level very similar to us. I mean, the, the analogy I use at the very beginning of the book is to say, you know, when you study Roman history, it feels a bit like you're walking a tightrope and you're kind of going along and you're looking down at Rome um, uh, on each side of the tightrope. And, and on one side, the tightrope, the vision from the tightrope looks ever so familiar. Um, you know, ideas of civil liberties, you know, simple ideas of running water, um, you know, roads, baths, whatever. And on the other side of the tightrope, it looks completely mad. You know, it looks weird. You know, you know, it, I always say, look, when you think about Rome, think about how anybody in the Roman Empire, really, who had started to think about how bodies worked would think about their bodies. Now, many people, I think, wouldn't have thought about how their bodies work. But I remember when I was an undergraduate, the thing that kind of... Uh, made most impact on me when I was thinking about the strangeness of, of both the Greeks and Romans was how they looked at the female body. Because not unreasonably, they, most Romans who thought about this believed that the mouth and the vagina were connected. And that basically, a woman's body was a tube um, which went in one end and out the other, right? Now, uh, you, one can say, well, that's sort of all sort of really mad science. Uh, and it is mad science. But you find that if, if you were to think then about what Roman doctors recommended for the treatment of sore throats in women, 
uh, it's not going to take you very long to see where they might have applied the cure, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's those kind of little, um, those little vignettes of how, you know, the, the world of ourselves just is so different. Although also the same, I've just very quickly done. There's a wonderful tombstone I'm very uh, attached to in, in Rome. It's a tombstone of a woman called Alia Potestas. And she lived in the third century AD, and she was in an interesting relationship with two men. Um, and they lived in a menage à trois, Alia Potestas and her two blokes. Uh, and Alia dies first, and they put up a tombstone to her. There's one thing that I noticed when I, when I was actually looking at this stone, I'd read it before. It's, they talk about their household arrangements. And they just say very quickly, she always got up before us and went to bed after us. And I thought, why was that? I know why it was, because you're doing the bloody housework, wasn't it? You know? And I thought, there you see a kind of domestic world that seems almost instantly familiar, while strange. Certainly strange. Um, Talked out with that sore throat. Or yeah, I, you, I mean, safe, you've, Dad. <laughs> you, you'll say. I hope so. Um, my throat feels absolutely fine, just for clarity. Uh, talk to us about the, the process. Could you pass me the, the book so I can show everybody in all its glory? I mean, writing a book of this length, which you know, it's not a small book, but to contain a history of Rome in whatever it is, five, five or six hundred pages, requires. An enormous discipline, I imagine, of, of, of work with the vast range of Roman evidence you've described. What was your process um, in, in going about selecting the material, navigating your way through the story? Um, I, I think it's very hard to reconstruct. I remember the hard work, uh, and I remember the bad days, and I, I kind of tend to forget um, you know, the, the processes of construction. But I think that for me... Um, it's a combination, really, of, t of two things. I think it's uh, basically 30 years of trying to get students interested in Roman history. And people often say, oh, you teach at the University of Cambridge. Um, you know, those you know, students, they must be really high level. Um, you know, that, you know, how can you write for the public when you've been teaching those, those little geniuses? And you have to say, you know, students at Cambridge, particularly in their first year, know nothing. And they're very hard to please, you know, and your lectures are entirely voluntary. And unless you want no one to turn up, you have to say, you have to get them on board with the idea that Roman history is interesting. And that's one side of the coin. I mean, telly is the other side of the coin, but I think the television audience and the student audience is not all that different. And what you soon realize, I think, from both those points of view, is that if you want to tell Roman history from the start to the finish, you are really, really stupid if you begin at the beginning, right? But, you know, if you begin at the beginning, you spend the first chapter saying, now, we really don't know anything about this. And one thing I have learned from telly is, you know, if you go on and on saying, now, we don't know about this, or we don't know about that, uh, the reader starts, or the viewer starts to say, well, I get to turn this off, aren't I? You know, if you don't know, why are you on your screens, right? Um, and students feel much the same. You know, if, you, if you really want to start at the beginning and go back to the 8th century BC, you will have lost your audience by week two. Right? Uh, and so I think the key thing for me was saying, let's start in the middle. Let's go to a moment in Roman history where we can tell you a day-by-day -day account of what happened, an absolutely key moment, 63 BC. Uh, we have the famous Catilinarian conspiracy uh, where a, a disgruntled, so it is said, a disgruntled aristocrat come terrorist was arrested and finally killed for wanting to destroy the city of Rome. And we have the protagonist's accounts of what happened. Now, you can go into that and you can say, look, let's just, let's just parachute down into one moment in this society which is 
partly familiar and partly unfamiliar, and see what's going on, and see why it is interesting to us. And it's interesting to us in all kinds of ways, because um, in the end, the terrorists are executed without trial, um, uh, in a way that is reminiscent of quite a lot of modern debates about terrorism, um, um, which is a a problem about Roman civil liberties, which never goes away. So it really is an issue there about how you, you know, what homeland security means. And you can tell that story, uh, uh, I, I think, quite vividly with real nitty gritty primary evidence. And then you can say to people, so here we are, we're in the first century BC, uh, Rome's, Rome's got a population of a million and it's got problems that we kind of share. How the hell did it get there? And then you can go back and say, well, this is how they thought they began. We, we have no idea, really, how Rome began, but we know what they told. And you can start to knit together all kinds of things that we're partly familiar with, Romulus and Remus, you know, the wolf and the twins. And I think just to point out to people that that's a really weird story. I mean, we, we think that we, we, when we look at back at the Greeks and Romans, we just, we take for granted some of these really mad stories they told, you know. So, you know, there was a pair of twins that founded this city who'd been suckled by a wolf and then one murdered the other one. Well, that's a really likely beginning, isn't it? Um, but once you've got people interested, I think you can then unpick and you can say, look, what is Rome preoccupied with? Rome is preoccupied, um, it, at least elite Roman writers are preoccupied with the idea of civil war, with brother murdering brother, uh, with the state being torn apart, not from the outside so much, but from within. And their own foundation legend, where twin kills twin, is a way of parading and foregrounding that. And you start to put this together in a way that makes some sense rather than just being a load of weirdo stories that Romans told about themselves. That makes, I mean, that makes a lot of sense and, and tells a lot about your craft as a writer of, which this is sometimes taken as a pejorative phrase, I promise you, it's not popular history. And a lot of popular historians now, my, myself included, don't work in universities. In some senses, you are a, a rarity in that you, you maintain a an academic career, write for you know the Times Education Supplement, or an editor for the Times Education Supplement, and so on. How do you balance those two things within your career, within your life, the academic and the popular, or is that a false distinction? Um, well, one answer is a hell of a lot of hard work, you know, because if you want to keep an academic career at the same time as doing telly in your spare time, you don't have many weekends left, right? But I, I think, as in a sense, I hinted before. I think in some ways it is a false distinction. And uh, uh, I mean, the most important thing for me about a popular audience is the basic principle that the popular audience is not stupid. I, mean, I think a lot of academics who do try to move sideways between an academic audience and a popular audience somehow think you have to tell a different story for a, for a popular audience. For me, the story... The basic story is the same. You might have to explain different things, um, but there's no difference in the story. People who pick up books on Roman history, they're not silly, you know? Um, they're intelligent, sentient, curious human beings, and in that, they're much like the audience, my students or my colleagues. Right? And I, I really kind of shudder when I hear people uh, say, well, they're now going to tell the story of, say, you know, Alexander the Great, but we're not going to worry the, we're not going to worry the popular readership with you know, any of those difficult problems about how you tell the story. Just get ahead and tell the story. And I think, actually, popular audiences, us, me when I'm reading about Dan's kind of stuff, I'm, you know, all of us are popular readers of something, 
Uh, we want to be brought into the process. We don't want to have somebody coming along and saying, listen to me, you people. I will now tell you what happened. We want to know about how they create the story, what they, what they do and don't know, and, uh, and how, how they make it make sense. So it's a bit like kind of in, in you know, mathematics. It's about showing, you know, the solution in mathematics is never very interesting. You know, what's interesting is how you get to it. And I think an awful lot of history, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I think the, the habits of Elagabalus are themselves fascinating, but it, it's how you get there and what you do to make sense of a culture that's 2,000 years old um, th that is absolutely fascinating for most people. You're a great popularizer of Roman history, and, and you know I flattered you enough, I think. Um, but you know, have brought your academic work into into the popular sphere. Of course, the other way that I think people interact with Roman history is through television dramas, through movies. You know, I'm thinking of Russell Crowe and and Joaquin Phoenix here. I, I think there's a quarter of a billion dollar big Roman history being touted around Netflix studios and so on at the moment. We have, you know, Rome is a reliable subject, Robert Harris's uh, uh, Cicero novels, Rome is a reliable subject for um, fiction as well as popular history. Yeah. Do you consume it, like Ooh, it, yeah. uh, welcome it, or are you allergic to? Oh, I, I, most of it, most of it I really love. Um, you know, and you know, the truth is that most people get into Roman history, not through picking up um, the works of Cicero. They pick up the works of Robert Harris. Um, and so most people's entry point into Roman history is through fiction. And mine certainly was. Um, mine was actually through the telly. It was the BBC's dramatization of I, Claudius. My God, it was good. Right? You know. I still remember the moment when Brian Blessed, playing Augustus, you know, stamped his fist on the table and said, is there anyone in Rome who has not slept with my daughter? I thought, oh, right, you know, this is for me, right? Um, and there's always been that sense. I mean, that, that Rome is, is a really great fictional medium, partly because it's larger than life. The Romans have always been in... in our imaginary terms larger than life, but also because of the nitty-gritty detail um, that we can still pick up and still um, still use to create stories. And you know, I think it's you know it's absolutely great. And I think that popular history and academic history is always um, in symbiosis with fictional history. And you know, go back to Rome itself and the division between fiction and history that we take for granted was not one that Romans would have recognized quite so clearly. And you know, in many ways, we're interested in storytelling, and there's fictional storytelling, and there's historical storytelling. And I think they, they're very good for each other, actually. Do you, are there any myths about Rome um, that you are constantly having to dispel, you know, talking about, I don't know, whether it's eating dormice or making yourself vomit after you're tickling your throat with a uh, feather, or th these little sort of factoids of uh, Roman history? Uh, yeah, all, all those, and sometimes I have to, have to say I'm, I'm wrong. Um, certainly, uh, Romans were not sick between courses. People talk about the Romans having such a thing as a vomitorium. Um, and so in order to consume loads and loads of stuff, they would go to the vomitorium and then return to the table. Um, there is such a thing in Roman history as a vomitorium. In fact, it's the exit road from the amphitheater, which is spewing out people from the amphitheater. <clears throat> but uh, I did get caught out with dormice, because I did once say, um, look, all this idea that the Romans ate dormice, you know, just how, you know, just how cliche is that? And I said something like, There's a good, the Dormouse rule is a good way of testing the historical accuracy of any television program. That, you know, the, the earlier it is that they talk about eating Dormice in the program, the more unreliable the program is likely to be, right? 
Uh, and I still sort of think that, but I was rather taken aback when um, I was writing about Pompeii about 10 years ago, and I was doing a lot of work in the Pompeii museums, and I was looking at a very large earthenware jar with little holes around it and little kind of troughs inside. And I, I said to one of the guys working in the museum, what's that? And he said, oh, it's a dormouse fattener. <laughs> and apparently, and he was quite convincing on this, you shove the little mice inside, they got little air holes, you put the top on, you put food in, and when they were really, really fat, you took them out and ate them. And I had to say, um, I couldn't myself think of a better use for this um, <laughs> object. So I thought, oh, God, you Puritan, you know, you should have... You know, there you are, being so sniffy about eating dormice. Probably they did. <laughs> I think that might be a good uh, opportunity to open questions up to the floor because we've got an enormous audience here at the festival. I'm sure everyone has questions they want, uh, want to ask Mary. Um, I believe there's somebody in the front row who was going to ask the first question. We, we're going to have microphones uh, brought to the audience so you'll be able to hear the questions as they're asked. Sir. Hello. Uh, I want to ask a question. What lesson can modern cities learn from Rome to create the eternal cities of the future? What can we learn from Rome in creating cities of the future? Is, is that yes. that's the question, modern, sir? Modern cities can learn in creating cities of the future. I think they can learn a, a, a prin some principles. And I think it differs across the world. But one of the things that my students find so... Um, confusing, baffling, but also enlightening about Rome, is that uh, Rome is this vast city, has terrible slums, etc., etc. but it, doesn't, it is not zoned. Now, my, my students grow up thinking that there are posh parts of town, you know, you could live in um, Belgravia, and then there's poor parts of town, like Brixton, and that cities are divided by wealth and class. Uh, one of the things that's extremely interesting about Roman cities is that that zoning by wealth and class does not seem to have been a basic principle of, of urban living. So, now, I'm not sure whether it's nice to think that if you were poor, you lived right next door to the house of some vastly wealthy plutocrat, but it gives the whole idea of what, of what living together is a very, very different feel. They also, and I think this is a message for many modern cities, is that they were not afraid to plow public money into, into public buildings and to services, right? That actually what the authorities were supposed to do is build buildings for the people. Uh, if the British government could remember that, I, I think we would be in a better world. Now, there's a young man sitting just in the third row here. Uh, so we'll take a question there. And, and a lady in the front row as well. So, um, like you mentioned, Romulus and Remus, uh, in some myths, they're the ones who found Rome. But actually, I believe that originally, they were also Greeks from Greece who somehow wound up in Rome and then the wolf Lupa took them. And then in Rome, they kind of copied the Greeks. They took Heracles, turned it into Hercules, took Odysseus, turned them, him into Alysseus. Uh, I don't know why they did that, but do you have any answer? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, and there's, there's sort of two questions there. One is, um, what's interesting about Rome is that it has all kinds of different legends of its foundation. The one that we know we're most familiar with is Romulus and Remus. Um, but there's also the legend of Aeneas fleeing from Troy to found the Roman people. 
people in Italy. And actually, when Aeneas gets to Italy, he finds Greeks already there. <laughs> so he sees around the site of Rome, which is occupied by some Greeks. And I think all those stories are interesting because they each give a very ideologically loaded view about Roman history. You've got the Romulus and Remus civil war kind of story. You've also got the idea that Rome was always a city which welcomed refugees, it welcomed people from elsewhere. Rome was a city that people came from the outside. It wasn't a city where you had to be there all the time in order to count. It's an absolutely multicultural, inclusive city. And that's, in a sense, where, in those legends, the Greeks come in. The other part of the question is about uh, the Rome's relations with the Greek world. And I think often Rome itself felt a bit like what you've said. The Romans, Romans wrote as if somehow they were always the kind of second generation. The Greeks had always thought about it first, uh, and then the Romans came and kind of take the bits that they like and translate it. And I think there are, that is still one, one part of the view of how Rome and Greece interact. I think more people are coming to the view now that um, even if that's part of it, what you're seeing across the Mediterranean is really a conversation between two uh, civilizations that are pretty much contemporary. And we often think that the Romans, and they thought of themselves, as coming after the Greeks. But if you, if you say, look, when's the origin, when are the, when's the earliest period of Greek culture, and when's the earliest period of Roman culture? Well, they both really get going in terms of an urban, civic culture in the 8th century. They're really growing up together. Greece gets literature a long time before Rome, but they're sort of growing up hand in hand and in contact, and the influence is going two ways. Although the Romans, we think of them as kind of great imperialist bullies, which they were in one sense, they were also kind of extremely anxious about their own cultural um, secondariness, you know, and so they were always saying, oh, we're not as good as the Greeks. We're not as good as the Greeks. Um, so you get a very complicated interrelationship. It's a really good question. I think we had a, a question in the front row from this lady here. Well, my original question was regarding the Aeneid, but um, I was more wondering about uh, the reason why they made everything Greek into more, something more warlike, something more barbaric in a way. Like, whatever I've read about Rome personally is something that they're, they're these imperialistic barbarians. And the whole point of view that we get from a, the Aeneid and, uh, you know, and from whatever experiences of Rome that have been recorded in history is that they were these imperialist, very rigid, Order and it doesn't actually fit with whatever you were saying about the multiculturalist re refugee accepting area. No, I, th I think that's very interesting, and I think that um, there, one part of the Roman story is the story of a brutal, militaristic, genocidal empire. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, I think we, we, however, and because we are in some ways heir of to a very 19th century romantic view of Greece, we kind of think of the Greeks, particularly the Athenians, as very nice types. You go to the theater, do philosophy in the marketplace, um, and sit around uh, drinking out of very, very pretty cups and being generally good, and then the Romans are generally bad. Now, the Greeks and every culture in uh, the ancient West, and I suspect I'm going to say every culture across the globe in the ancient world was militaristic, barbaric, horrible, and genocidal. And you know, Alexander the Great does not deserve the title the Great, in my view. I and mean, Alexander the Great was a drunken, genocidal conqueror um, who was lucky enough to die young, so he didn't get he didn't get a bad press. Um, I, I think that, so I, th I, I think very much it's, 
It's not that those aspects are not true in some senses, but that we modern readers and viewers, um, we impose different characters uh, on on the Greek world and the Roman world. And you know, for me, when people often, you're right, I mean, people often and commonly say, you look at the Aeneid, this is, um, this is a, a, an epic for a militaristic empire. And I say, well, fine, but try the Iliad then, folks. You know, because if you want real nasty, you know, blood-curdling violence, it's in um, the Homeric epic of the Greeks conquering the Trojans. So it's, it's, we, we have selected different aspects. And I think that you know, in terms of empire, uh, kind of the one final thing to remember is the Romans were brutal imperialists. Uh, it, it's often the case that imperial cultures, while at one level being appalling, also produce the dissidents that are the best critiques of empire. And um, my own favorite quote, I think, of all in uh, of the whole of the of Roman literature is the Roman historian Tacitus, who puts into the mouth of one of his characters a description of the Roman Empire, which I think uh, does, uh, is, is a better description of any imperial project and a quicker one than anyone has ever made. Uh, Tacitus has his guys say, what do the Romans do? They create a desert and they call it peace. And I think uh, the, you know, the modern world is still creating deserts and calling them peace. Well said. We have a gentleman uh, just here with a microphone, sir. As an Indian, I'm interested to know whether there has been interactive, interactive cultural goods and services exchange between India and Roman Empire, and, uh, number one. Number two question, you are talking about history and fiction. As to what extent there is a difference between the historical facts as narrated in the Roman history, which of is the character of Antony and Cleopatra by Julius Caesar? Oh. Similarly, the case with regard to Julius Caesar, Anna. Um, I, I think that the relationship cultural and economic relationship between Rome and India is extremely interesting and it's one of the uh, areas of modern work um, which is uh, throwing up some really new things uh, archaeologically and I think that there has been traditionally a very kind of narrow version of what the Roman Empire is Right, and people, particularly Western scholars, have wanted to put a very neat boundary around it and say, that is the extent of the Roman Empire. Well, well it's becoming increasingly clear that the Roman Empire and the relations of the Roman Empire with the outside, in its terms, the outside world, are vast kind of tentacles that go both ways. And I think one of the things that um, was... Uh, caused me the m most enlightenment, really, was that I, I think it's true to say that the Archaeological Museum in Delhi has the second largest collection of Roman coins in the world. <laughs> some, some extraordinary statistic. Or, I mean, when you think about it, logical, but really makes you think, look, um, you have to see Rome from the outside, you have to see it from the east as well as from the west. And there are really uh, extraordinary discoveries now being made along the ports of the Red Sea, where there are uh, absolutely colossal quantities of um, pepper uh, and other spices being discovered, uh, imported from the East. And India, India's economic relationship, um, who was profiting, God knows, um, but India's economic relationship with the Roman Empire and the exchange of ambassadors and so forth is much a much deeper thing than, than used to be recognised. As to, uh, fiction and history and Antony and Cleopatra, uh, Shakespeare and Julius Caesar, I think the problem about Antony and Cleopatra is that um, they're, they're two historical characters who can never escape fictionalisation. 
and it started, um, it started in 31 BC uh, when they were defeated by Octavian, who was going to become the first Roman uh, emperor, uh, and he mounted one of the most successful propaganda campaigns ever mounted, which has been successful for more than 2,000 years, to say that Cleopatra was a beautiful, gorgeous woman, and Antony was, was a, a man who was mislaid into the paths of love and luxury by his mistress. Now, that may be the case, and you know, it does make a great story, but actually, probably Antony was relying on Cleopatra because she had money. Right. <laughs> and he needed people to kit out his army <laughs> in the end unsuccessfully. So in its way, as, as, mu uh, as mythological as the Romulus and Remus uh, yeah. tales almost. Yeah. Uh, I think we have, th we have probably time for one last question. And um, well, you've had three questions. Uh, so we'll go with uh, the gentleman with his hand up with the beard um, and a little red sort of thing of me on his jumper. The Holy Roman Empire, which came up during the later ages, was it in any way influenced by the older ancient Roman Empire, or was it an offshoot of the same thing? A uh, question about the Holy Roman Empire, the later medieval and later um, empire. Well, uh, in Western Europe and more widely, that, that, co that saw itself uh, as uh, a descendant of the Roman Empire. Um, that is also, that was their fictionalization. They certainly um, modeled their, their ideas of what an empire was um, on Rome. Uh, they took the kind of titles that Roman emperors took. Um, was there any real connection? Um, almost none. Although if you were to go to the east and you were to go to Byzantium, um, although we kind of tend to say now that the Roman Empire fell in the 5th century AD, then there's a bit of a gap and then you get the Holy Roman Empire. What's very interesting is that if you go to the eastern part of the Roman Empire, it goes on thinking of itself as Roman until the 15th century, again using the titles. And we call that empire the Byzantine Empire. They didn't call themselves the Byzantine Empire. They called themselves the Romans. That's what they thought of themselves. And they, they were in direct line of succession. The Holy Roman Empire was rather invented succession. And everyone else called them Rome as well, all their neighbours, yeah. Actually, we have got what, time for one more. So, sir, just in the middle there with a, a purple jacket, or maybe the microphone has gone, uh, in which case? I think, I don't know. There's a microphone? Who, who, okay, I think we've run out of time. Um, Sorry. <laughs> we almost got there, but uh, we, we want the festival to keep to time. Um, it's an, it's an honor, it's a pleasure, it's a privilege to have Mary Beard here uh, to share her wealth of knowledge about Rome with us and, and to answer so many questions. Please, a big hand for Mary Beard. And Mary will be talking in a couple of hours about women and power. So you may as well just stay there, actually. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. With great pleasure, we would like to thank Dame Mary Beard and Jack.